In this video, we're going to look at John Rawls' theory of distributive justice, specifically what's known as the difference principle. Now, Rawls is probably the most influential political philosopher of the past hundred years, at least. And we're reading an excerpt from his landmark book, A Theory of Justice. Rawls' theory of distributive justice is the most widely discussed since it appeared uh, over 50 years ago now. Now, Rawls' theory is an equality-based theory of distributive justice. His main idea is that the essence of justice is fairness. As he puts it, the principles of justice are the principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests would accept in an initial position of equality. As this quote illustrates, Rawls is in the social contract tradition of political philosophy that also includes Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant. Rawls asks us to conduct a thought experiment in order to help us determine what we would agree to in an initial position of equality. He asks us to imagine ourselves in what he calls the original position. Now, it's important to clarify that he doesn't think that this is a position that anyone has actually ever been in or could be in. But by imagining ourselves in the original position, it helps us to think about what principles we would all agree to if nobody had the ability to skew things in their own favor or unfairly manipulate others. So in this original position, Everyone is behind what Rawls calls a veil of ignorance. That is, no one knows his own place in the society. No one knows their own social class, their own natural abilities, their own intelligence level, their own strength level. They don't, you don't even know what sex you are, what race you are, or even your own conception of what a good life is. You don't know your own psychological traits. Now, why is all that important? Well, it's important because it makes it impossible for you to privilege your own group, your own interests, uh, your own advantages at the expense of others, because you wouldn't even know what group or interests are yours. And so you wouldn't be able to tilt the tables in your favor. And that's why, according to Rawls, the original position is a fair situation in which to agree on social arrangements. So what principles would we all agree on if we were actually in the original position? That's the question. And Rawl says that, first of all, we would all agree to a principle of equal rights. That is, we would agree that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties that are compatible with a similar scheme of liberties for others. This first principle is not really a principle of distributive justice in particular, it's about political justice. So for example, he thinks we would all agree to confer on each other the right say to free speech or freedom of religion or free association to the widest possible extent until our exercise of liberties began to impinge upon and violate the same liberties for other people. All right, so, so far, like I said, that's about political justice, but Rawls also says additionally that we would all agree to a second principle of justice that does involve socioeconomic matters. And according to this principle, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, and B, attached to positions and offices that are open to all. Now, let's look at both parts of that principle, starting with the second part. The second part requires formal equal opportunity. Social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are attached to positions and offices that are open to all. Anyone can compete for them. 
Now that's fairly uncontroversial, at least for most modern Americans. It's the first part of his principle that is more innovative and controversial. The first part, which is known as the difference principle, says that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage. Now, if the inequalities are arranged so that they are to everyone's advantage, that means that they must be to the advantage of those who are least well off. In other words, the difference principle entails that a distribution is just if it maximally benefits the least advantaged class in society because they're part of everyone. And that, it seems, will require an extensive redistribution of wealth from the most wealthy to those less well off. In order to, ex to explain what the difference principle is gonna require, I'm going to use some vastly oversimplified charts of different economic models. Now, as a disclaimer, I know that this isn't actually how economies work exactly or what the charts would really look like. Um, it's just to illustrate the point. In any case, let's consider first of all, a totally free market situation where there is no attempt to enforce any kind of equality other than equal formal opportunity. There's no redistribution of wealth. That kind of scenario, plausibly, is likely to result in vast inequalities of wealth, such as is shown here. And I've got four cartoony representative members of the society. It's a simple society, it's only got four people in it. Note that the poorest member of society, Donnie, in this picture only has say $1, where the richest member, Richie, has seven. Now let's consider a situation in which the government redistributes wealth so that everyone has the same amount. Now, Donnie is doing a little bit better than he was before under the free market, but because there's no reward for hard work and innovation, the whole economy is severely depressed and nobody is doing very well. Because if you start making more money than your neighbors, it's gonna be taken away from you. So why bother? But now thirdly, let's consider a situation in which there isn't enforced equality, but rather only, small, uh, only a smaller percentage of Richie's wealth is taken away and redistributed to Donnie. In this case, there's more wealth in the society overall than in the last scenario because we haven't totally disincentivized industry and enterprise. Richie still gets to keep a lot of his profits and make more money than us. But it also means that there's more wealth available for Donnie. So this is the kind of arrangement which maximally benefits Donnie, the least well-off member of society. And that is the kind of arrangement that satisfies the difference principle. That's the kind of scenario that Rawls's principle uh, endorses and envisions. So uh, that's Rawls. And in our next video, we will look at Robert Nozick for a very different view.